Count your quarters and put your game face on. We're at the Amphibian Arcade, where foolish young frogs blow a month's allowance trying to win a flimsy prize they could have bought at the dollar store. Luckily, I'm far too cunning to fall into such a trap. So while I'm here practically earning money, we'll cover identity and self-concept, and how these are influenced by self-evaluation. We'll start by looking at self-schemas over the skee-ball area. I hope you brought exact change, because the price per play is oddly specific. These labels should help you remember that self-schemas are the specific labels one assigns themselves. These can pertain to personality, appearance, or interests. For example, I'm shy, I'm tall, I'm a marathon runner are all self-schemas a person could have. All an individual's self-schemas combine to form their self-concept, which is why this Arcade Concepts logo spans the skee-ball area. Self-concept is the overall way in which one views or defines themselves. hence the reminder to define your fun. This can include aspects of one's personality, body image, interests, roles, self-worth, and so on. Self-concept begins to develop in infancy, when the existential self forms, which you can remember by looking at this frog, who found himself on a coin-operated pony, unsuccessfully searching for the last remnants of joy in this world. Suffice it to say, he's having a big existential crisis. And just like this guy will remain separate from the other patrons while he's up on that platform, the existential self is the understanding that one is an individual who is distinct and separate from other beings. Now let's leave him to continue his search for meaning. Ah, the young and unencumbered. That's more like it. These twin froggos are riding a cat to represent the categorical self. And they're closely related because the categorical self involves how one relates to others. Specifically, it's the awareness that even though everyone is unique, people can be categorized by traits. When the categorical self develops at around age two, kids are able to group themselves based on concrete things like age, gender, and hair color, leading simple self-schemas to emerge. As people grow older, they can identify how they relate to more abstract groups like culture, interests, career, etc., which leads them to take on more complex self-schemas. The development of categorical self leads an individual to take on many identities, some of which are more important than others. This leads us to the prize station. That ladder in the saline pool of prize goldfish should help you remember hierarchies of salience. Salient simply means most notable or important, so a hierarchy of salience refers to how an individual ranks their identities by importance. You'll notice that the prizes are organized with stuff for musicians on the bottom, athletes in the middle, and parents on the top, as a reminder of ranking one's identities from least to most important. Most people find that their hierarchy of salience changes based on the situation they're in. For example, someone might feel that their identity as a doctor is the most salient the majority of days, but their religious identity feels more important on holidays. Tell you what's salient for me right now, that 8,473 ticket Frog Bop album. Guess I gotta go hit the games if I wanna take home those sweet, croaky tones. And while we're at the video games, we're gonna take some time to look at how identity is influenced by the ways people view and evaluate themselves. <coughs> we'll start with self-esteem, which you probably know is one's overall opinion of themselves and sense of self-worth. That's why this frog is self esteeming up the mirror with positive feelings about her reflection. Get it, girl! But I don't see any tickets coming out of that mirror, so let's move on to look at what influences self-esteem. Fuel-efficient racing seems like an efficient way to bring in the mother load. Plus, it represents self-efficacy, which is one's belief in their ability to do things successfully. This racer clearly has high self-efficacy, as he's looking pretty confident about choosing extra hard mode. Self-efficacy can be specific to a skill, so someone who's super athletic but also tone-deaf might have high self-efficacy when it comes to finishing a marathon and low self-efficacy when it comes to playing Beethoven's Fifth. 
Locus of control is another term that describes how confident an individual is they will succeed. A person's locus of control can be internal, which we've represented with this gal munching locust crisps inside the game booth. And she's got total control over this dino wrangling mission, because when someone has an internal locus of control, they believe they have a strong ability to affect the outcome of situations. This might look like saying, I've practiced lots so I can win the game. However, it's important to note that while we've depicted internal locus of control with a positive outcome, that is, winning the game, it can also be associated with negative outcomes. For example, one could say, I always lose because I never practice. On the other hand, if someone has an external locus of control, they believe they cannot control the outcome of situations. That's why this sad fella outside the booth can't control a thing with his unplugged controller. Someone with an external locus control might say, the game is rigged, so even with practice, I'll never win. Learned helplessness is a phenomenon that can stem from having an external locus of control. So we've placed this helpless Hank game near the frog with the unplugged controller. Learned helplessness occurs when someone fails repeatedly at something. So they begin to believe that they have no power to change the outcome in the future. Ultimately, they stop trying altogether because their efforts feel futile. Sort of like this frog who gave up on helpless Hank after losing... Uh, quite a few times, it appears. And Hank sure doesn't let you forget your losses. Comparison to others typically plays a large role in self-evaluation. This frog is dressed as a referee to represent a reference group, which is a group someone compares themselves to in order to assess how they stack up in an area. Notice how the novice on the right is comparing his dancing to the ref's expert moves. One's parents might act as a reference group for what their romantic relationship should look like, while a pro sports team might serve as a reference for their athletic abilities. Finally, a person's understanding of how others perceive them is believed to play a large role in their identity. This is called the looking glass self, so we've symbolized it with this frog using a looking glass cursor to select an avatar of how she thinks she appears. Well, I'm not quite sure what happened, but I'm out of quarters, $86 in the hole, and still 7,023 tickets short of that frog bop record. So let's review before I start to dwell on my losses. A self-schema is a label a person assigns themselves based on a specific aspect of their identity. All of one's self-schemas combined make up their self-concept, which is an overall view of who they are. The first part of a person's self-concept to develop is the existential self, which is the understanding that they are distinct from other beings. Then the categorical self develops once they gain the ability to categorize themselves based on traits they share with others. All of a person's identities are organized in a hierarchy of salience, based on which identities are most important to them in a given setting. Self-esteem is a person's overall sense of self-worth, and can be influenced by their confidence in their ability to succeed at tasks, or self-efficacy. Similarly, locus of control describes how much power a person believes they have to affect the outcome of situations. People with an internal locus of control believe they can affect outcomes, whereas people with an external locus of control believe that their actions don't make a difference. Having an external locus of control can lead to learned helplessness, which is when a person stops trying altogether after repeatedly failing at a task. Finally, a person's self-esteem and self-concept is often greatly influenced by comparing themselves to others and understanding how others view them. A reference group is a group that someone uses for comparison to see how they stack up in an area, and the looking glass self is how one believes others perceive them. <sighs> After this expensive and fruitless debacle, I'm feeling a bit shaken in my identity as a cunning frog bop aficionado, so I think I need to hop on one of those ponies to ponder it all. Who am I? <laughs>